talking about augmented reality libraries. So Sridhar is currently working as an Unity developer in TCS Interactive Labs at Chennai. He has two years of experience in AR, VR, game design, big data, and machine learning. So yeah, over to you. Uh, hi, uh, hi everyone. Thanks for coming here. Uh, so. So I'm Srikar and I'm currently as working as an XR developer in TCS Chennai and uh, I'm pretty much a beginner in this field so uh, and I wanted to just share whatever I found interesting in AR and uh, just you know uh, just talk about it and as you might have guessed from the title I'll be speaking about uh, augmented reality and what uh, goes on behind the scenes in augmented reality and highlight some possible issues and you know give, try to at least uh, show some solutions while I've not actually made uh, any uh, uh, a demo to showcase right now, at least I'm hoping to do so in the future and come back and uh, share it. So it's just putting things out there. So uh, this is somewhat an outline of my talk. So I'll be talking about some vision and then AR and then how all these things come in and then put in some uh, ML, AI, etc., and then give some conclusion. So uh, we'll first talk about vision. So uh, vision. In this uh, scenario is basically computer vision, which uh, I think has been a very active uh, field for quite some time. So, uh, and in my view, I think you can summarize the entire uh, CV process into three, these three steps. So you acquire an image from a sensor and then you process it and then you analyze it to get some details out of it. To see an example, uh, this is a, a example license plate detection. So you are uh, applying your canny edge detection pro process to get that edge detected. And then you crop the rectangular part of the image to get the uh, necessary thing. And then you try to detect your characters in this. And then you analyze it to uh, perform OCR and then do that stuff. Right, uh, so uh, I think CV forms a foundation of like whatever we do in physical reality. So right now, if I give a computer uh, an image, it's mostly with uh, the real scenarios in, in, in mind. So uh, taking this one step further is uh, augmented reality. As you can see, this is a spectrum which is pretty famous. It's been proposed by Milgram. So augmented reality is just a, a layer on top of um, physical reality and all the way to the other side is virtual reality where you take your user to a entirely new world and then you uh, it'll be it'll be fully virtual right so uh, uh, and now what is augmented reality uh, if you do a quick Google search you will be getting this as a result I think this is one of the good definitions which I like so you're just uh, adding a, a virtual content to the real world and then you are giving a composite view of it. So you're augmenting the user's reality in some sense. All right? So uh, the defining characteristics of an ideal AR scenario will be these. So you are blending the real with the imaginary. So in this case, uh, I mean, the fam most famous game probably could be Pokemon Go. So you're seeing the uh, character Pikachu in your real world somewhere. And then you're trying to interact with it. By This is the second one. The third one is that the character which you're positioning will always have to uh, exhibit some sort of predictable behavior. So if I'm placing, for example, a chair in some corner of the room, it doesn't mean that after a while the chair starts floating around. That's not a predictable behavior to it. So uh, that should not happen, ideally. But because the real world is a lot of uh, chaotic, you have all these things changing at, I don't, uh, at unpredictable levels. So the user could decide to move the camera back, or it could just uh, uh, just uh, some blur could happen because lack of focusing, or some image noise could come in, or the lights could just turn off, or something like that. But all these things should be handled uh, effectively by your application. And this is where I think uh, a computer vision comes in. And uh, summarizing AR, uh, I think this is what these four steps could be basically uh, some sort of an algorithm to say what AR does internally. So uh, while some condition is true, which is which could be optional depending on your uh, use case. So I have to update the tracking data, which is the position of the user, the uh, rotation of the device, etc. And then you update the environmental data, so the lighting conditions, the scale, or something like that. And then check if there has been any previous uh, updates which has happened. So uh, uh, from the previous data, if there is any change happening. So you have to un understand, OK, so there is a change. So I'll go to the fourth step, and then I'll update the already placed uh, virtual objects position based on whatever I got. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, the first two steps are normally simultaneous. They're called uh, SLAM algorithms, which uh, most AR libraries use. So, uh, so we'll be looking at them together for uh, the rest of the talks. So uh, because our uh, user environment is not predictable, we need to con constantly keep a track of the position of the user's device at all times. So this kind of happens via positional tracking and rotational tracking. And uh, it is known as pose estimation uh, in, in, in AR at least, right? So except, and, and except in some cases, the, uh, the device and the virtual object you're placing needs to have some, some form of a common coordinate system to speak with each other, or at least some common language, if not the uh, thing. All right, and normally you use sensors to do this. So I could use camera, accelerometer, gyroscope, and et cetera to uh, inform my decisions in this region. And uh, so uh, before I begin my experience, all, all I need is some reference points, right? So I need to have some reference to base all my experience about. So I scan my room and then I know, okay, uh, so there are some fixed points for me to identify. This is a rotational thing. And then I turn this side, and so they should see, see some fixed point there to identify that there is there has some, some rotation happened. So for this, uh, you use something called as key points, which are uh, quite uh, some form of uh, distinctive images in an image. So uh, distinctive points in an image. I'm sorry. So uh, they help us to keep track of what uh, things are constant, etc. And they're called as features in this environment. You can also call them as trackables. You store them in a database, and then you understand. Uh, 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 and use it for further references. And uh, all the tra features should have the following properties. So uh, they should be reliable and they should be invariant to any sort of movements. So reliable in the sense that I have, uh, suppose if I have a pet as a feature point, it is not reliable because it will keep moving around and my experience will go uh, mad. So you use some, uh, all this happen, you use some SLAM methods as I mentioned earlier. So you have SIFT and SERV, which are quite popular, but uh, comparatively speaking, BRISC, I think, is uh, a bit faster. So uh, and it is a derivative of something called as a fast algorithm. And uh, for any algorithm, you need two points to work. So it should be uh, detecting sufficient key points to understand your environment. And it should describe the key points and uh, give, give, give them some form of unique fingerprints. So it should be like I uh, each of the key points, even if they are in the billions of uh, number, so uh, e each of them should have a unique fingerprint to be uh, for the app to be able to differentiate one from the other. And uh, uh, these key points are often called as spatial anchors. So uh, most more often than not, uh, the developers, when you're uh, working on it, we use it to define uh, position an uh, object and keep it stationary or at least uh, uh, perform some motion. And this should ideally happen each frame unless we want it to happen otherwise. So uh, giving an example, we have, uh, this is the fast algorithm. So uh, if you see here, uh, the central pixel P is taken in an image. And then you uh, take the surrounding 16 pixels to find out the brightness uh, comparison results. So for brisk to call it uh, uh, key feature points, at least nine pixels should be brighter or darker. So in this case, if you see all the top uh, part of the circle, is are all brighter, so P could be a feature point. And now once you detect this feature point, uh, uh, for brisk at least, it creates a binary string by encoding all these uh, uh, brightness comparison results and then giving it the value so of a unique fingerprint. So uh, this is an example image. So for this, we will try, uh, apply brisk a bit. So here I just use some open CV, which is readily available. You have a brisk algorithm. It does all the processing for you and all that. But you don't use, op might not be using open CV in a mobile screen, but yeah. So all these are the key points. I hope this is visible. So uh, if you see, there are a lot of key points, and especially these circles which you are looking at. So all these are the key points, and uh, they might not actually be needed in, uh, uh, in our real scenarios. So now once you detect these key points, you make a database out of it, as I mentioned earlier. And you ideally will be looking at uh, all these uh, images in multiple scales. So for example, I could take the same image in 10 different scales. And then I could say that, OK, if my key points are not present in at least six of them, I can discard them safely because they are not reliable to me. So that way, you could ideally uh, you could reduce some uh, key points, and then you could 
use them later. So you can say that more key points are better, but they are very, very much expensive to track. And uh, this is where error correction comes in, again, to reduce your number of key points. So uh, you could ideally say that I'm removing some form of outliers. So I can say by using some simple geometry method, I could write an algorithm to connect to key points and then discard all the key points that are to the top of it and keep them to the right. But you could, uh, this, this, uh, this thing could vary depending on the scenario you have. Uh, it, it just uh, some example which I came uh, so I'm saying. So you can use uh, the remaining key points to uh, calculate the pose of the f uh, user and then uh, define the whole experience again. So, uh, so going back to our algorithm, this one step gets added. So performing error correction will be quite important in this, say, in this case because uh, it will be like some form of a feedback loop which you are getting to, I don't know, uh, uh, refine the movements, etc. Okay. Uh, so other, other aspects of AR are uh, basically lighting of the surrounding environment, the user interaction. So I'll, I should be able to uh, probably hit this, uh, flick a ball or something, and they should fly to the other corner of the room. And then there could be points on a, uh, so there could be feature points detected on some sort of a slanting surface. They, uh, and another part is about uh, hiding objects. So uh, it should, it'll be like I'm behind the table. The camera should be able to identify that I'm behind the table. And when something else comes in front of me, I should be uh, hidden behind, uh, behind that object. So uh, once you understand what uh, these are, uh, you get to place the virtual object in the user's environment. And this is done by mesh, uh, using some meshes. So all 3D, all virtual objects spe uh, specifically are uh, a combination or are made up of meshes. So if you see the breakdown here, so this is like I'm, uh, they are just ultimately a bunch of points. So you're taking a point cloud and then you're make, generating a mesh out of it. And now uh, uh, considering the data you have from the earlier steps, you try to change uh, certain parameters of that particular object. So what you do is you just could vary, add some shadows to it, or you could uh, change the amount of lighting which is being reflected off it, and then you could change its scale or dimensions or something, or amount of object visible, etc. Uh, the last part, as I mentioned, uh, is called occlusion, and it's especially difficult because you need a depth uh, sensor data or something like that to understand what it is. So how do AR libraries handle this? So uh, they, these are some of the libraries which I've uh, been familiar with. So uh, I'll give examples out of ARCO because that's what I've been using mostly. Uh, so on launching an AR app, uh, you f the app will first of all scan the surroundings. And then as I mentioned, there is already an existing database. So it will try to match uh, the, uh, the points it scans at that on launch with the existing database. And then it will give the pre-downloaded uh, key points and all that. And then if, if nothing exists, it will initialize a new map. But in a, either case, when the user starts, so for example, I have a map of this location. And then I start moving further. Uh, as I go further, my map keeps getting bigger. And uh, this data ultimately will be used to uh, uh, create my AR experience. But again, another thing is that my bigger maps will mean more computations to manage because all these uh, 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 computations are like I have to triangulate the positions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because, and uh, additionally, this is more difficult because my phone has a limited number of resources which I could use. So uh, this is an example. So th taking this image, so those, uh, the top uh, thing is the feature points that are detected. And this could be uh, some form of a map. And this is the depth sensor data, which uh, most libraries are not currently doing. And uh, yeah, so uh, some major issues. So we've seen what hap what are the basics and all that. So some major issues, I can say that it's about improper occlusion and performance drops. The other two uh, depth distortions and inaccurate tracking data are basically uh, some variant of occlusion uh, handling. So if you're able to handle occlusion well, and then uh, di distortions and tracking could be probably corrected automatically. So uh, I could hard code all of these, but uh, that's a pretty difficult task, especially in real scenarios. And uh, this is an example of occlusion, as I've mentioned. So the dragon should ideally be behind the chair, but it's in front of it because it, uh, the camera doesn't know that there is a chair here uh, to identify. 
So uh, try to solving occlusion, you have to get uh, depth cameras and then uh, get the depth data and then aggregate this over frame over a bunch of frames to generate, okay, there is this continuous data, so there could be a 3D object present there. And this is assuming that I have Uh, it could vary depending on. Yeah. No, uh, right now in mobile devices ideally it should it'll have a single camera. Right. So uh, when you consider uh, example Tango phone, so it, it it does this depth calculations pretty well. But right now the thing is that you most phones do not have this depth uh, depth okay. depth. depth. If you have depth That I'm not actually sure of that. So I think uh, in one of the examples I've seen, they've used uh, I think five cameras to get that stereo data and then manage things accordingly. But I'm not actually sure of that. Sorry. Okay. So because most phones don't have the depth sensor data, and uh, you are, your task is becoming that you have to generate a 3D uh, reconstruction from a 2D image, right? So uh, assuming that you do have the depth sensor data, you uh, take this point cloud and add it to the point cloud which you made from earlier, add it to the uh, uh, depth data from this thing and then combine it over, again combine it over multiple frames to end up generating a mesh. But this is still a hard task with more performance jobs because there is only limited resource we have uh, that we could use. So one good solution which I think could be applied here is bringing in uh, some form of machine learning or augmented reality but uh, uh, that's just one of the solutions and I think I'll uh, continue with this. Uh, so the goal here is simple. So you have to detect a depth in a given image by using some method and then you use this data to generate a mesh out of it by combining it with the existing point cloud data. Uh, so some ways to do this is that some, some uh, they are already using some neural networks along with some other tools to do this. So this is an example from something called a Celerio so the, uh, they uh, try to uh, create a mesh in real time and then place the objects on top of it. So when you see that the camera moves pal, uh, down, you see that the balls there are hidden. So uh, before we go and see what is happening here, so probably we could take a small detour. This is one example of portrait mode in pixel phones. So if you see that there are uh, uh, things like this, the depth here is changing because of the thing, and uh, I think this is uh, this is the example where I mentioned they used five different phones to calculate the depth, at least during the training phase. Okay. Uh, the second part is that uh, this is about face tracking, which from AR cores augmented faces. Uh, it has newly been released. So uh, I mean, uh, I think a few months ago or one month ago. So here, what is happening is that if you see that uh, there is this. Uh, green uh, color mesh which is forming on face which is being tracked as the uh, user moves around and this is another uh, example which I wanted to tell okay so the common denominator between these two is all is, is tensorflow so uh, Google especially they used a tensorflow specifically tensorflow light to uh, uh, to uh, uh, create this experience so they made uh, the processing faster so they uh, introduced GPU support as well to give uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, speed up between these things. And to put things in context for the augmented ex faces example, so the depth tracking and all that, so that they, they took some model and then they deployed it onto the uh, uh, the phone and then they you could use a CPU to do that or a GPU. So using a CPU you have a uh, number of, so it takes around 30 milliseconds per frame to infer some uh, data out of it. But in GPU, you're, it is reducing uh, quite uh, drastically to around 10 or something like that. So these are some other results. So for the full mesh and the light mesh. So uh, while I understand that uh, this is just not the only solution, so you could have a bunch of other solutions like uh, they also had, I think uh, fr it's from Cornell. So they had a, a thing called mega depth. So they were using some form of CNNs, et cetera, to understand what, uh, the uh, depth information from a uh, image. The second one was, I think, uh, which which I found personally interesting was something called as point neck. Uh, that was about uh, removing. The, uh, if you remember, the point cloud had to be generated into a 3D mesh and then it had to be occluded, right? 
So from point cloud directly to occlusion, you uh, from there trying to understand what the point cloud itself without having generate without having to generate a 3D model out of it. Okay. So uh, th these are examples. So we could probably uh, develop more such things and then port it into TensorFlow Lite and then uh, work on top of that and enhance the overall AI performance without uh, doing any compromise. So, uh, so far, whatever we have seen, I think could pro will probably be around 1% uh, of what AR actually is. Uh, it is still uh, very much an emerging field and it has uh, very great potential for exploration. So, uh, I think uh, even from a business perspective, you could see that augmented reality is around here. Uh, it's, it's moving towards the productivity area and it's taking around 5 to 10 years to do this, according to Gartner. But uh, I think uh, because we are all in the open source uh, world, we could probably take up uh, these uh, conversions and then, uh, I don't know, speed these things up to probably go there less than two years, something. Because, uh, and I'm still a beginner, as I said, and uh, I'll, I'm probably hoping to come up in some future for summit and then give the results of whatever happened in this process. So uh, here are some great references which I found are interesting. I'll uh, leave this up in uh, my GitHub or somewhere, so you could uh, take a look at them. So uh, thank you. That's it. So any questions? In that Euphoria, I think is is cross-platform. So uh, we basically use. What uh, in our team we use something called as Unity Engine. So uh, on top of in Unity, you can uh, just install some. Uh, I mean, uh, add these libraries and then take any build whatever you want. B with Vuforia, I've done with a Android and then uh, iOS, both of them. AR Core is basically for Android, but you do uh, have some extensions into iOS. I'm not so sure about AR, AR kits. Uh, this thing. So I think does that answer your? Yeah, AR Foundation, I think it's relatively new, right? So what AR Core has been a bit uh, there. A and when you compare the features between AR Core and AR Foundation, some, some things are still lacking. So I think as, uh, for the last time I've seen, one thing is about uh, image detection. So it, it will detect an image in an environment, and then it will uh, put an object on top of it as it detects that image. So that feature I, I don't think is still present in AR Foundation. Maybe they might have added it. I'm not sure. And that's one of the things. And uh, I find AR Core more appealing because uh, uh, Google is doing a lot of other research in terms of uh, TensorFlow, et cetera. And you can easily write uh, some, I don't know, an Android app, in native at least, to uh, combine this, this uh, AR Core with TensorFlow or something like that and then uh, you know, continue the experience or something like that. Yeah, on device, that's where TensorFlow Lite comes in. Uh -huh. So this this has, yeah? So you can do that Yeah, you can do that. So uh, TensorFlow Lite has optimized uh, some, I'm not sure how they do it internally. I'm still yet to explore that part. So yeah, the, uh, TensorFlow Lite will be of a great help in this, in this case. So we uh, normally i think they could be I'm not sure of the games which are there like the big ones so uh, normally from what i've seen many companies are internally using it so in case of uh, for example for euphoria at least uh, you could have uh, some companies are doing it to i don't know uh, uh, guide the uh, uh, field agents in doing various tasks or something like that so uh, it depends on the use case again but i'm not sure of exact uh, names which i can give Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the good okay, applications yeah, you could yeah, have. Yes. So I think more people like this. So that's it. Any more questions? Thank you, Sweeper.